five get into trouble by Enid Blyton. After much discussion and many promises, the famous five had managed to persuade Uncle Quentin and Aunt Fanny to let them go away on a cycling holiday. So after lots of waving goodbye and promising to be careful, and with everything packed and strapped to the bicycles, each with a rucksack on their back, the children had set off with Timmy happily running alongside them. They had a wonderful first day with glorious spring sunshine and after a splendid picnic, cycled off to a place beside a lake that Julian had spotted on the map. There they had a quick swim and after a delicious meal prepared by Anne, they snuggled down in their warm sleeping bags. The next morning was fair and bright but George snuggled deeper into her sleeping bag, despite the fact that Timmy was pawing her, asking for a walk. Anne prepared the breakfast, while Dick and Julian went down to the lake where they were astonished to see a shiny green bicycle standing beside a tree. They heard splashing from the lake and saw a golden-haired boy in the water who swam over to them and waded out onto the bank. Hello there. Uh, have you come for a swim too? Nice pool of mine, isn't it? What do you mean? It isn't really your pool, is it? Well, it belongs to my father, Thurlow Kent. He's one of the richest men in the country, isn't he? Uh, that's right. Well, if it's a private pool, we won't use it. Oh, come on. Race you to the other side. Okay. okay. When Anne went to the lake to wash, she was astonished to find three boys there instead of two. They swam to the side of the pool and Anne could see the third boy was about her own age and not so big as Julian and Dick. The boy smoothed back his dripping hair. Hello there. Hello. What's your name? Richard. Richard Kent. What's yours? Anne. We're on a biking tour. My name is Julian, and he's Dick, my brother. I say, I hope we're not trespassing on your land, as well as on your water. Well, you are, as a matter of fact. But I give you free permission. You can borrow my pool and my land as much as you like. Oh, thanks. It didn't say private or anything, so we didn't know. Would you like to come and have breakfast with us? If you dress with the others, they'll bring you to where we camped last night. When Richard arrived at the camping place, George had only just got up and her short hair looked very tousled. And when Richard was told her name was George, he first of all thought she was a boy. Hello, George. My name's Richard. I live about three miles away. Can I put my bike somewhere safe? If I lose it, my father will be angry and he can be very fierce if anyone offends him. He's made plenty of enemies and has to take bodyguards about with him. Gosh! What are his bodyguards like? Oh, they're all big, hefty fellows. We had one last year who was awful. He had the thickest lips you ever saw and a great big nose. His name was Rookie. Gracious, he sounds horrible. Has your father still got him? No. After one furious row, my father chucked him out. Good thing, too. I hated him. Has your father got a bodyguard now? Oh, rather. I say, aren't you lucky to be allowed to go off alone like this on your bikes and sleep where you like? My mother would never let me. She's always afraid something will happen. Actually, I don't think we'd be allowed to rush off completely on our own unless we had old Timmy. He's better than any bodyguard. Anyhow, where's the map? It's time we decided where we're going to be making for this evening. Here it is. Good. Look, we'll make for Middlescombe Woods. See? There they are on the map. It'll be a jolly nice ride. Right. Let's tidy up everything here and get started. Yeah, come, come on. on. Yeah. Look here. I've got an aunt who lives by those woods. If I can get my mother to say I could come with you, will you let me? I can go and see my aunt while I'm there. Well, if you aren't too long about it, of course we don't mind you coming with us. We can drop you at your aunt's on the way. Good. I'll go straight off now and ask my mother. 
and meet you at Croker's Corner. It's on your map. Right. We'll just clear up here, and then you'll have time to go home and ask permission and join us later. We'll wait ten minutes for you at Croker's Corner, and if you don't turn up, we'll know you didn't get permission. Richard shot off on his bicycle looking excited. And after clearing up, with Timmy sniffing about for dropped crumbs, the famous five set off for Croker's Corner. When they arrived there, they were astonished to find Richard already there. He told them that his mother had given him permission to go with them and stay at his aunt's for the night. So they all set off together with Richard in very high spirits, despite being told off by Julian for trying to ride three abreast. At 11 o'clock, they stopped to buy food for lunch and found a perfect spot for a picnic on a hillside overlooking a small valley. They ate most of their food and then dozed off in the afternoon sun. When they woke up, they remounted their bicycles and set off for Great Giddings, where Richard's aunt lived. After an hour or so, they rode into the village, and Richard suddenly stopped and pointed to a house standing in a small garden. That's my aunt's house over there. Well, thanks for your company. I hope I shall see you again soon. Goodbye. He's gone. What a sudden goodbye. Isn't he odd? He certainly is. I wonder if I should have gone with him and delivered him safely on the doorstep. Don't be an ass, Julian. What do you think could happen to him between the front gate and the front door? Nothing. It's just that I don't trust that young fellow. To tell the truth, I wasn't even sure he'd asked his mother if he could come with us. I wondered about that too. He did get to Croker's Corner quickly, didn't he? And he had quite a long way to go and had to find his mother and talk to her and all that. Still a little puzzled, they set off for Middlecombe Woods, where they found a good place to camp for the night in a little dell, perfectly hidden away from prying eyes. Julian, George and Timmy set off on foot to see if they could find a farmhouse to buy some food, while Anne stayed with Dick, who wanted to mend a slow puncture on his bike. They had been there for about half an hour when they heard a shout. Julian! Help! Julian! Timmy! Can you hear something? Yes, somebody shouting. I wonder why. Julian! Dick! Where are you? Help! It's Richard. What in the world does he want? What's happened? Here he is now. Look. He looks frightened out of his life. Dick, Anne, they're after me. You must save me. Where's Timmy? He'll bite them. Who's after you? Where's Julian? Where's Timmy? They've gone to look for some food. You look awful. What is the matter? I want Timmy. Which way did they go? I can't stay here. I shall be caught. They went along that track over there. Richard, whatever is the matter? Julian, Timmy, where are you? Help me! What's happened to him? And why isn't he at his aunt's house? He kept saying someone was after him. He's got some bee in his bonnet about something. Bats in the belfry. Mad. Dippy. He'll give Julian George a shock when he runs into them. If he does, the odds are he'll miss them altogether. I'm going to climb this tree and see if I can see anything of Richard or the others. It's tall and easy to climb. All right. I'll carry on seeing to my puncture. Anne climbed the tree and peered into the gathering darkness, but could see nothing. Dick, below, was just finishing his puncture when he heard a sound coming from the surrounding woods. It was a stealthy noise, as if people were gradually closing in. Dick didn't like it. He was just about to call up to Anne when the noises came again. Then suddenly a brilliant light pierced through the trees and fell on Dick and two shadowy figures came striding towards him. Dick blinked in the bright light coming from the torch. A man made a grab at him. Ah, oh, so there you are, you little misery. We've been chasing you for miles, haven't we? And you thought you'd got away? I don't understand. Who are you?
you? You know very well who we are. Yeah. Didn't you run away screaming as soon as you saw Rookie? He went one way after you, didn't he? And we went the other. And we soon got you, didn't we? Now, come along, my pretty little Richard. I'm not the boy you're looking for. My name's Dick. Oh, so you're Dick. That's short for Richard, isn't it? Uh, you're the Richard we want, all right. Richard Kent. I'm not Richard Kent. Take your hands off me. Yeah, come Get on. off. Don't no. shout or no. suffer. Oh. You'll be sorry. No. Once you're at Hell's Dean, we'll no. deal with you properly. Oh. Now, come no. on. Come on. No. Come on. Anne was sitting absolutely terrified up in the tree. She couldn't move or speak, but just had to sit there and hear her brother being dragged away by two strange ruffians. She trembled so much she was afraid she'd lose her hold and fall. After a while, she heard the sound of footsteps and voices. Who was it? Oh, let it be Julian and George and Timmy. Let it be Julian, George and Timmy. While all this had been going on, Julian, George and Timmy had been looking for a local farm to buy some food, but couldn't find one. Now they were hurrying back to where they'd left Dick and Anne. Timmy ran on ahead of them, sniffing here and there to make sure they were on the right path. Suddenly, he stiffened and growled softly. The two children heard some distant shouting coming nearer and nearer. Julian! Timmy! Where are you? Where's Timmy? They're after me! Julian! It sounds like Richard. What in the world is he doing here? And yelling like that too. He's coming this way. Oh, Julian, it's you. You must help me. Please help me. Richard, what's up? What's the matter with you, Richard? I'm scared stiff. Honestly, Julian, please help. Pull yourself together. Stop making a silly fuss. What's happened? My aunt's away. Away? But didn't your mother know that when she... I didn't ask my mother's permission to come with you because I knew she wouldn't let me. I was going to ask my aunt to telephone her and say I'd gone off with you. But my aunt was away, and... Uh... I'm ashamed of you telling lies like that. Yes, I'm sorry, but... All right. But what I want to know is, what were you scared of when you came rushing along yelling and crying? It was horrible, Julian. I had just left my aunt's house and was cycling to join you in Middlescombe Wood when a car came towards me, and Rookie was in it. And who is Rookie? I told you about him. The horrible bodyguard with thick lips and a big nose that my father chucked out. He always swore he'd have revenge on me and my father. So when I caught sight of him in the car, I was terrified. I see. And what happened then? Rookie recognised me and turned the car round and chased me on my bike. I pedalled for all I was worth. And when I got to Middlescombe Woods, I rode up a path where I knew the car couldn't follow me. They stopped the car and two men I didn't know went one way to find me and Rookie went the other. I threw my bike into the undergrowth and hid and waited till I thought they'd gone and crept out, tore down this track hoping to find you. I thought Timmy would go for the men. <sighs> but the two men must have been hiding and as soon as I began to run, they chased after me. I dodged and hid and then I came across Dick who was mending a puncture. But it was Timmy I wanted so I tore on and on till at last I found you. What about Dick and Anne? Yes, quick, we must get back to them. Come on! When they arrived back at the little dell, it was quite dark, and they were alarmed to find no one there. Then they heard Anne's trembling voice, and Julian helped her down from her perch in the tree. Anne was surprised to see Richard with them, and even more surprised when she learned how he came to be there. She told Julian and George exactly what had happened to Dick, and they all realised that the two men, who had never met Richard, thought that Dick was the boy that Rookie wanted them to capture for him. When Anne told them that she had heard the men say they were taking Dick to a place called Owl's Dean, they looked at Julian's map and discovered an area called Owl's Hill. Pretty certain that Owl's Dean must be near to Owl's Hill, they set off down the rough woodland path, with Richard riding Dick's bike and Timmy, as usual, running alongside. Eventually, they came to a lane and set off for Owl's Hill, which was about two miles away. The moon was up, and as they cycled down the lane, it was nearly as bright as day. We can switch off our lights and save our batteries. We can see perfectly well out here in the moonlight. I see, Julian. 
I'm jolly hungry. So am I. Me too. <laughs> Whoa. We've only got that bit left over from lunchtime, but that's better than nothing. We'll stop for a minute and finish it off. That pine copse over there is off the road and should be all right. Come on. They went under the pine trees and were munching away when they heard the sound of a car and went to the roadside hoping the driver would help them. They could see no headlight, but as the sound came nearer, the children got ready to leap out into the road to stop it. But the noise of the engine died away suddenly. The car had no lights on, not even side lights. Julian put his hand out to stop the others from rushing out into the road. He knew something strange was going on. Look, the car is stopped by that tumble-down hut. A man's getting out of the car. And he's carrying a bundle of something. He's gone into the shadow of the hedge. An answering signal. I wonder what's happening. Keep absolutely quiet. George, look after Timmy. Don't let him growl. Keep quiet, Timmy. There's another man coming from the trees. And he's gone to meet the man who got out of the car. He's taken the bundle and... Look, he's taking clothes out of it. And now he's changing his own clothes and putting on those in the bundle. I'm scared. Shh, they're coming this way. Keep quiet. I was beginning to think that you were never going to get here. Well, we're here now. Oh, well, what shall I do with me old clothes? Don't bring her in the car. Stuff them down a well. I don't be long doing it. They're both getting into the car now. Well, what was all that funny business? They said they were going to put his old clothes down the well. Shall we go and see? Yes, let's. I say, did you manage to get the number of that car? I only got the letters KMF. I saw the numbers. 102. It was a black Bentley. They're up to something. I'll be bound. They made their way to the well by the old shack. But it was so deep they could see nothing. Then, still puzzled by the strange events, they finished off their food and set off as fast as they could in the brilliant moonlight to Owl's Hill. After what seemed miles and miles, they arrived there and were pushing their bikes up a steep hill when they saw the outline of a house that looked like an Elizabethan mansion. They pushed on and came to some great wrought iron gates, which, to their relief, had the name Owl's Dean written on them in brass letters. To their intense surprise, the great gates suddenly opened and they heard the hum of an approaching car coming out of the house. On Julian's orders, they crouched down in the ditch with their bicycles as the car came out of the open gates. It swept past them and disappeared round a bend on the hill. The children came out of the ditch with Timmy and their bikes. Did you see that car? The black Bentley again. KMF 102. That's mysterious. What's he doing rushing around in the night? I don't know. But look, the gates are still open. Funny how they opened when the car came. Yes. Come on, let's go in and snoop round. We might be lucky enough to find old Dick somewhere. Yes, let's. Come on, Timmy. Well, we're in Al's Dean and... Oh, look, Julian. The gates are closing. Wait, Julian, try and open them quick, quick. They won't budge. Come on, help me, everyone. See if we can pull them open. It's no good. We're locked in here, and just look at that huge wall running round the property. We're just as much prisoners here as Dick is. If he is here... What are we going to do? Well, the first thing to do is hide our bikes under the trees and go snooping around on foot. I just hope there's no dogs here. Should we walk up the drive? No. In this moonlight, we'd be easily seen. Keep to the grass on the side. Come on. What's that? What is it? Chew, something touched my hair. What is it? I'm scared. So am I. I want to go home. There it is again. What is it? It's all right. It's only an owl. 
A screech owl out hunting. I'd rather have a brown owl any day. They make a nice noise. No wonder it's called Owl's Hill. Come on, let's go on. They followed the curve of the drive and eventually came to a big house with a light in a room on a top floor and another one on the ground floor. Otherwise, from that side, the house was dark. The four children and Timmy walked quietly round to the back of the house. Everything was dark there too, except two long windows with curtains pulled across. Julian found a place where the two curtains didn't quite meet and looked in. It was obviously a kitchen and a miserable looking woman was filling hot water bottles from a kettle. Then Julian saw a man come into the room, a funny dwarf-like fellow with a hunched back and a very evil face. He flung himself into a chair and threatened the woman with a poker. The woman said no more, but went on filling the bottles. Julian told the others what he had seen. They didn't like it at all. They went round the house and looked up at a window that was lit high up. Was Dick up there? Dare they throw a stone? Julian decided they would, and taking one from the side of the drive, threw it up very carefully. It hit the glass with a sharp crack. Somebody came to the pane at once, but went again before the children could see if it was Dick or not. They had just decided to go to another part of the house when they noticed a casement window a little ajar. Julian went to the window, opened it, and was soon astride the sill. He helped the others in, and just as Timmy was about to join them, something happened. A powerful torchlight beam shone across the room into the dazzled eyes of the four children. Well, 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 a crowd of young burglars. How dare you break in here? And we'll shut the window and keep that wretched dog out. Let my dog in! Ouch! You hit me! That's what happens to boys who go against my wishes. Look here! We are not burglars, and we want to be handed over to the police. Oh, you do, do you? Aggie! Aggie, bring an oil lamp in here! Here it is. What are those children now, doing? Now, just get out and keep your mouth shut. Oh. You hear me? Go, get out. So you think the police would approve of you breaking into my house, do you? Yes, because we have reason to believe you've got my brother locked up in here somewhere, and it's all a mistake. You've got the wrong boy. We've got no boy here. You're being ridiculous. Now, it's very late. Would you like to bed down here or go back out into the night? There's no phone here or I'd ring your home. I think we'll stay. Right. Aggie? <coughs> yes, sir. These kids are lost. Get a room ready for them. No. Just put down some blankets and mattresses. Oh, and give them some food if they want it. Right. What about my dog? Why can't he come in with us? I'm warning you, he'll attack anyone he meets out there. He won't meet anybody. By the way, how did you all get through the gates? Car came out, and we slipped in before the gates closed. How do the gates shut? By machinery? Mind your own business. Take them off, Aggie. No, yeah, right, yes, sir. Aggie led them upstairs, and Julian helped her to get the heavy mattresses. She seemed grateful as if she wasn't used to anyone ever helping her. But when Julian asked her if there were any other children up in the house, she was terrified. Don't ask questions like that or Mr. Purton will tell Hudgy to whip you. He's a terrible man. All right. When's Rookie coming? Rookie? What do you know about Rookie? Is he coming here? I thought he was in prison. He's bad. Bad. Don't tell me he's coming here. Oh, I'll get you some food. This is a bad house, full of secrets. I think that man, Mr. Purton, is waiting for Rookie to come and see if Dick is Richard or not. But when he finds he isn't, I've no doubt he'll set him free. And us too. But what about me? He hates me. He'll hold me for ransom. Oh, I'm scared. No. We must try and prevent him seeing oh. you. And stop wailing. Haven't you any courage at all? All this has come about because of your silly lies and deceit in the first place. Oh, it is not fair. <laughs> Aggie brought them some coffee and bread and jam. And when she had gone, they threw some down to Timmy below to let him know they were still there. Then Julian decided that he was going to explore the rest of the house. He told the others to pretend they were asleep. 
and he made a lump in his own mattress, which looked as though he too was asleep. Then he slipped out of the room and hid in a big, musty old cupboard. After about 20 minutes, through a crack in the door, he noticed that a light was coming. He peered through the crack and saw Mr. Purton go to the children's room and peer cautiously inside. Obviously satisfied, he came out, locked the door, and to Julian's relief, he left the key in the lock. Then Julian watched him go down the passage and disappear into a room and lock himself in. Julian waited a while, crept out of the cupboard, stole up to Mr. Purton's room and looked through the keyhole to see if the room was in darkness or not. It was. Then going very carefully, he crept upstairs and along a passage connecting the ends of the house. Door after door was ajar and obviously empty. Then he came to a door that was closed. He knocked gently. Who's that? Shh, it's me, Julian. You all right, Dick? Julian, how did you get there? This is marvellous. Can you let me out? No, the key's gone. What did they do to you? Nothing much. They dragged me off to the car and shoved me in. They waited some time for the man called Rookie, but he didn't come. So they reckoned he'd gone off to see someone they had meant to visit. He's coming here tomorrow. What a shock for him when he finds out I'm not Richard. Richard's here too. I wish he wasn't because Rocky will kidnap him, I'm sure. The only hope is that Rocky will see only you and the men think we're all on family and let us go. Did you come straight here? Yes, the gates opened like magic and I was shoved and locked in here. One of the men was just telling me what awful things Rookie was going to do to me. Then there was a crack on the window, and he went downstairs and hasn't been back. I bet that was when we chucked a stone up at your window. Ah, so that was what the crack was. The man went to the window at once and must have seen you. Anyway, we should be out of here by morning when Rookie finds I'm not the boy he wants. How did you all get here anyway? Julian quickly told Dick the tale from the time he and George had met crying Richard to the moment he had slipped up the stairs to find Dick. Then worried that they might wake up their captors, Julian said goodnight to Dick and went back down the stairs. The house was in complete silence. Everyone seemed fast asleep. So Julian decided to do a bit more exploring and crept down to the ground floor. He went into several rooms but found nothing of interest, until he entered a sort of study with a big desk and a curious instrument with a stout wheel-like handle. There was a label attached to it. Left gate, right gate, both gates. Excitedly, Julian twisted the handle. He turned the handle back, fearful that the noise would awaken the men. Hmm, most ingenious. Whatever it is. That's strange. Somebody's snoring. Somebody asleep not far from here. That's certain. There's no one in this room. Yet I can hear snoring. Most peculiar. It seems loudest by this tall bookcase. Somebody is asleep. But where? Julian began to examine the bookcase, a very solid affair, right up to the ceiling. But one shelf seemed different to the others, less tidy, books not jammed together. He quietly took the books from that shelf and put his hand at the back and felt about. A knob was hidden in the corner. Cautiously, he pressed it, but nothing happened. Then he pulled it, and it slid out a good six inches, and at the same time the whole back of the particular shelf slid quietly downwards and left an opening big enough for someone to squeeze through. Julian held his breath. A dim flickering light came from the space behind, and Julian could make out a tiny room with a table and a few articles on it, including a burning candle. Beside the table was a bed, and on it lay a big, burly man, 
snoring peacefully. Julian realized he had found a secret hiding place and did not dare stay there any longer. He pushed the knob and the panel slid up again. He felt excited, but much too tired to think any more, and went back to his bedroom and lay down on the mattress and fell fast asleep. He was awakened next morning by the woman. If you want breakfast, you'd all better come down and get it. And if you want to wash, you can wash in the kitchen. Breakfast, did you say? Yes. And don't be too long about it. I'll see you downstairs. June, did you find Dick last night? Yes, he's all right. He's in a room upstairs. Oh, that's oh. marvellous. And I found a secret room with a man sleeping in it. And I discovered the machinery that opens the gates, too. How thrilling. Come on, let's go downstairs to the kitchen before that woman comes up for us. I hope that Hunchy won't be there. I don't like him. Hunchy, however, was there, finishing his breakfast at a small table. He scowled at the children, but they took absolutely no notice of him. After they had washed, they sat down at a large table and tucked into some boiled eggs, bread and butter and hot coffee. Julian talked cheerfully and winked at the others to do the same and not let Hunchy think they were scared in any way. Really glad we all slept so well. Shut up, you. I expect we slept well because we were so tired. Yes, I was exhausted. I shall be glad to get back to a proper bed tonight. Did you hear what I said? Hold your tongues, all of you, making all that row. Hold your tongues. I don't take orders from you, whoever you are. You hold your tongue. Or else be civil. Oh, don't talk to him like that. Please don't. He's got such a temper, he'll take a stick to you. I'd take a stick to him. Except I don't hit fellows smaller than myself. Yeah, oh, I'll skin you alive, you young fool. I'll slaughter you. I'll, I'll, I'll... Losing your temper again, Angie. Keep it till I ask you to use it later, if these kids don't behave. You, Aggie? Get a meal ready. A good one. Yes, sir. Rookie's coming with some others. Keep these children here, Hunchy, and keep an eye on them. I may want them soon. I'll see you later. Rookie's coming. Get on with your work, woman. I've got to keep an eye on these kids. Go and get the vegetables. Oh, Go on, get on yes, with you. Shall I clear away and wash up for you? You look very tired, and we've got nothing to do. Yes, we'll all help. Do, do, oh, thanks. Thanks. Very much. Yeah, you kids, you won't get round me with your smarmy ways. Yeah, oh. yeah to you too. Oh, quack. Oh my. About an hour later, they heard a curious grinding noise, which Julian told them was the gates opening. The children went to the window to see what was happening. Timmy was outside sitting patiently. George opened the window and Timmy looked up at her inquiringly. Then, just as Hunchy screamed at them to shut the window and come inside, the black Bentley swept past and pulled up at the front door. Three men got out, and Richard crouched back, his face going very pale. Julian glanced at him and realised he was very frightened, and that one of the men was Rookie. They heard the noise of the gate shutting and footsteps going upstairs. After a few minutes, the footsteps could be heard again, and a loud argument started just outside the door. He's not a boy, you fools! You've got the wrong boy! I told you! Let go of my arm! Go on, let go! Richard! Yes, Julian? Well, Hunchy's not watching. Go over to the grate and rub soot into your hair. Quick, go on! Soot? Yes. Rookie may not recognise you so easily if your hair is black. Go on, quick! That's it, more! More, go on! That's better. You look quite different. Now stand over in the dark corner. Sounds as if they're coming in. I'm scared. Are these the other kids? Yes. Hello, Dick. Well, Mr Purton, I'm glad to see you've got my brother down from the room you locked him up in last night. I imagine that means he can come with us now. Why you brought him here and made him a prisoner, I can't imagine. Now, look here, you children. We, uh, uh, well, quite frankly, we made a mistake. 
You don't need to know why or how. That's none of your business. This isn't the boy we wanted. We told you it was our brother. Quite. I'm sorry I disbelieved you. These things do happen. Now we want to make you a present for any inconvenience you've suffered. Um, ten pounds for you to spend on ice creams and so on. And don't try and tell any fairy stories to anyone. See, we made a mistake, but if you say anything silly, we shall say we found you kids trespassing in the grounds. Understand? I understand perfectly. Well, I take it we can go now, then? Yes, now. Here's ten pounds. Yeah, now clear out all of you and forget all this, or you'll be very sorry. He opened the door that led to the garden, and the children trooped out silently, Richard well in their midst. Timmy barked and flung himself on George, as if to ask if she wanted him to bite anybody. The woman came out to watch them go, and much to her surprise, Julian gave her the ten pounds. Then they heard the gates opening, and set off up the drive with Richard on the bar of Julian's bike and Timmy barking away at their side. Suddenly, Anne gave a scream of horror. Julian! Look! Look! The gates are closing again! Quick! Quick, we'll be left inside! Everyone saw in horror that the gates were slowly closing. as fast as they could, but it was no use. By the time they got there, the two great gates were fast shut, and seconds later, they heard the sound of a car coming down the drive. The children turned to face it, and Richard ran behind a bush in panic, terrified of having to face Rookie again. The car drew up by the children and stopped. Yes, here they are, still here. Where's that other boy? I can't imagine. I wonder if they had time to cycle out of the gateway. Why did you shut the gate so soon, Mr. Purton? There's the little brat skulking behind that bush. C come here, you. Uh, ah, I thought so. This is the boy we want. Uh, he sooted his hair or something. That's why I didn't recognise him. I knew there was something familiar about him. That's why I wanted another look. Ow! Leave me alone. Stop shaking me. I'll get back at your father now. He'll have to pay a very large sum of money for his horrible son. That'll pay for some of the lies you told about me, you nasty little rat. Ow! Now you stop that. Let the boy go. Haven't you done enough already? Now you talk about kidnapping. Haven't you just come out of prison? Do you want to go back there? Why, you cheeky young rat, just let me get my hands on you and Don't I'll show you. Ow! 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 He's bitten my hand. Get him off. Go on, get him off me. Ow! Ow! Now you open those gates and let us out. And put that stone down. Yes, I'll set my dog on you again and you'll be sorry. Rocky, drop that stone and don't be a fool. That dog could make mincemeat of us, great ugly brute. Look at his teeth. Let the kids go, Rocky. Not till we've finished our plans. Keep them all prisoners till our jobs are done. I'll take the little rat with me when I go. Yeah, I'll teach him a few things. And his father, too. Leave me alone! Shut up, you miserable little coward. You never did have any courage, always running around telling tales. Oh, rookie, you'd better come up to the house and have that hand seen to. You can deal with the kids afterwards. Oh, all right. Interfering little brats. I'm frightened. I want to go home. Oh, shut up, Richard. Rookie said you were a little coward, and so you are. I'm sorry. I really am. I've always been a bit of a coward. I can't help it. Yes, you can. Being a coward is just thinking of your own miserable skin. I'm sorry, but I've never had friends like you before. I won't let you down again, honestly. Well, we'll see. In the meantime, stop howling for a bit and let's have a talk. Right, everybody. This is maddening. I suppose they'll just lock us up until they finish this job, which I imagine consists of getting that hidden fellow away to safety. The one I saw in the secret room. 
Won't Richard's parents report his disappearance to the police? Yes, but what good will that do? No one will have the faintest idea where he is. Uh, Hello, there's that woman Aggie, or whatever her name is. There you are. I've come with a message. They say you can either stay in the grounds all day and not put a foot inside the house, or you can come into the house and be locked in one of the rooms. Oh, I'm sorry you didn't get out. It's not right to keep nice children like you locked up. Thanks. But tell us, is there any way we can get out of this place beside the gates? No. No way at all. Mr Purton said I wasn't to give you much food. He said Huntry had to put food down for the dog with poison in it. So don't let him eat anything except what I give you for yourself. The brute! Shh! Don't let them know I've told you all this. But you're kind, and you gave me all that money. Now listen, it'd be better if you stay out here in the grounds. I can give you bits of extra food then. Thank you very much. We'd rather stay out here in any case. It'll be good if you could get some extra food, but we don't want you to get into trouble. Uh, don't worry, I'll manage something for you. But don't let the dog eat anything Hunchy puts down for him. It'll be poisoned. Maggie! Oh, that's Hunchy. I must go. Bye. Well, well, well. So they thought they'd poison old Timmy. They'll have to think again, old fellow, won't they? <coughs> After all that, the children thought they would explore the grounds. But they found nothing of interest except a big garden, a couple of cows, and a large number of hens. Obviously, the place was self-contained, just the place to hide secrets away from the outside world. They were just discussing how careful they would have to be not to let Timmy near any food put out for him when they saw Hunchy come out of the kitchen with a bowl in his hand. Hey, you kids! Here's your dog's dinner! Don't say a word, George. We'll pretend to let Timmy eat it, but we'll really throw it away. Look, Hunchy's going to the cow shed. Go and bring the bowl over, as if you're going to give it to Timmy. All right, Jew. I know what we'll do. We'll pretend that Timmy only ate half, and we gave the rest to the hens. Good idea. Then Hunchy will be upset because he'll think that they will all die, and he'll get into trouble. Here's the bowl. Get that spade, Jew, and bury this food before Hunchy gets back. <clears throat> That's it. Well and truly buried. Let's go to the hen house now, and when we see Hunchy, we'll wave to him. Then, George, you pretend to scrape some scraps out of the dog's bowl into the run. Hello. We're giving your chickens some food. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> What's the matter? Can't we give the hen some scraps? Is that the bowl I put the dog's food in? Yes. He didn't eat it all, so I've given the rest to your hens. You fuck! Ain't your boy giving my hens that food? You deserve a good whipping. Oh, where's my broom? Stupid boy! I'll get even with you! Where's my broom? I've never seen anyone bother to creep a hen run before. Nor have I. He must be very anxious to bring his hens up properly. Hard work, too. Pity to sweep up all the bits of food, though. Seems a waste. Yes, yes, you clear off, you little piss, or I'll hit you with this broom. He looks like an angry hen who's just about to cluck. <laughs> I'll get you. <laughs> Goodbye. Well, we gave him more than he bargained for. About ten minutes later, they heard Aggie calling to them. On the windowsill was a loaf of stale-looking bread and a piece of dry yellow cheese. Nothing else at all. Hunchy was grinning. Then Aggie came out of the kitchen door carrying a washing basket that appeared to be full of clothes. She sharply told them to take the bread and cheese and eat in the garden and informed Hunchy that she was going to hang out the washing. But she also smiled at the children and nodded her head towards the basket. The children understood immediately. They snatched the bread and cheese from the sill and followed her. 
She set down the basket under a tree, well hidden from the house, and with another smile went back to the kitchen. When the children opened the basket, there was milk, a large meat pie and a collection of buns and oranges, complete with knives, forks and plates. The children carried the things behind some bushes and proceeded to eat a first-rate dinner. Timmy got his share and even gobbled up the hard, dry cheese. When they had finished, the dishes were packed back into the basket and the clothes drawn over them again so nothing could be seen. After about half an hour, Aggie came outside to them again. Thanks, Aggie. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Aggie. You are kind. You never know when Hunchy's listening. He's got ears like a hare. I'll bring some tea out for you when I come collect the eggs. You're a wonder, Aggie. You really are. Hey? Oh, thank you very much. But I must go back in now before Hunchy starts asking questions. Bye, Bye. Aggie. Poor old thing. What a life. I shouldn't like to be cooped up here for years with these ruffians. We shall be if we don't think of some plan of escape. Yes. We'd better think hard. Let's go over to those trees there. We can sit on the grass without danger of being overheard. Yes, and I'll go over and keep an eye on Hunchy. He's over there, look, polishing the black Bentley. I'll pass near there with Timmy and let him growl. He'll see he's still alive and kicking. Good idea, George. Come on, the rest of you. Follow me. Come on then, Timmy. You come with me. <coughs> Hello, Hunchy. You going off for a ride? Can Timmy and I come with you? Don't you let that dog near this car. I've seen Rookie's hand. One finger's very bad indeed. I don't want that dog going for me. Do take us for a ride with you. Timmy loves cars. Go away. I've got to get this car ready for Mr Purton this evening. Go away and let me finish the job. Oh, all right. Come on, Timmy. Well, you can see Timmy's all alive. Good thing, too. We'd be in a bigger fix if Timmy wasn't here to protect us. Hello, George. What did Hunchy say about the car? That he was getting it ready for Mr Purton this evening. Did he now? Jew, you've got a plan, haven't you? What is it? Well, I was just wondering about something. That car... And the fact that Mr. Purton is going out in it tonight means that he'll be going through those gates. What of it? Thinking of going with him? Well, yes, I was. If he's not going out till dark, I could get in the boot and hide there till the car stops somewhere. And then I could open the boot, get out and go off for help. Julian, that's a brilliant plan. Sounds jolly good. They discussed the matter thoroughly. At tea time, Aggie left some food in the hen house and afterwards they played around the house, much to Mr. Purton's annoyance. When it became dark, they went cautiously to the car. Hunchy had finished working on it. Quietly, Julian opened the boot and looked inside. Oh, bother! What's the matter? It's too small. I can't get in there. It's too small for me too, I'm afraid. I'll go then. Certainly not. Well... I'll go. You? You'd be scared stiff. Yes, I should. But I'm still ready to go. I'll do my best if you'll let me try. After all, it's me or nobody. Well, this is serious, you know, Richard. If you're going to do it, you've got to do it properly. Go right through with it. Not get frightened and start crying. So that the men hear you and examine the boot. I know. Please trust me a bit. But I can't understand you offering to do a difficult job like this. I mean, you haven't exactly shown yourself to be plucky so far. Julian, I think I understand. Richard's thinking of our skins this time, not his own. Let's give him a chance to show he's got some courage. I only just want a chance. All right, you shall have it. Tell me exactly what I've got to do, please. Well, once you're in the boot... We'll have to shut you in. Goodness knows how long you'll have to wait there in the dark. It'll be jolly stuffy and uncomfortable too. And even more uncomfortable when the car moves off. Poor Richard. As soon as the car stops anywhere and you hear the men get out, give them time to get out of sight or hearing. Then scramble out and go straight to the nearest police station. Tell your story quickly and give this address. Owls Dean, Owls Hill. And the police will do the rest. Got all that? Yes. 
you still want to go, now that you know what you're in for? Yes. Richard, you're nice, and I didn't think you were. Well, Richard, pull this off and you'll wipe out all the silly things you've done. What about getting in the boot now? We don't know when the men will be coming out. Right, I'll, I'll get in now. Dick, Richard won't be able to open the boot from inside, so find a bit of stick or something, and when he's in, I'll wedge it open a bit. Right, you are. In you go, Richard. Yeah. That's it. You're cramped, but at least you're in. Now, where's that bit of stick? Ah, oh, thanks. It'll give him a bit of air, too. Quick, Julian, I can hear someone coming. Right. Good luck, Richard. The children melted away into the shadows and saw Mr Purton talking to Rookie and then leave him and go to the car. The engine started up and the car purred down the drive. There was the sound of the gates opening and shutting. The front door of the house closed and the children stood in silence thinking of Richard. After a while, Aggie called them to the kitchen for some supper and whispered there wasn't much because Hunchy was there. They went into the kitchen where there was a log fire and a mellow light shining from an oil lamp. Hunchy was polishing something at the far end of the room. Take that dog out. No. I'll tell Rookie. Well, if he comes, no doubt Timmy will bite his other hand. Anyway, won't he be surprised to find Timmy still alive and kicking? I'm going to tell him now. There was something about one of you on the radio at six o'clock. The one called Richard. His mother had reported him missing. Oh, good. Then we'll be traced here, then. Nobody's ever been traced here. The police have been here, and Mr Purton lets them in, all polite-like, but they never find anybody. And there's no phone here, nor electric, nor water laid on. It's just secrets and comings and goings and threats. Right, now then, Hunchy, where's that boy Richard? Which one of you lot is Richard? Who's Richard? Richard? Why? There's only four children here. There were five. Where's that kid, Richard? Tell me or I'll have you. Uh, uh, Didn't I say that dog had to be poisoned? Where's that boy, Richard Hutchie? He doesn't seem to be here, rookie, sir. Unless one of those boys is him, sir. No, he's not one of them. You kids, where's Richard? I don't know. He was here with us in the grounds all day. And now we're indoors, he isn't here. I'll shout for him. Richard! Richard! Shut up! Hunchy, bring the torch and we'll go and find him. I'll go one way and you go the other. Get Ben and Fred too. I'll attend to you lot when we get back. Uh. Oh, where is he, poor boy? We don't know exactly, but it's a good job he isn't here. I didn't like the look on Rookie's face when he came into the kitchen just now. After about an hour, Rookie and the others came in in a furious temper with Rookie uttering terrible threats as to what he would do when he found poor Richard. The children were glad he was out of the way. But where was he now? Was he still in the boot of the car? They wished they knew. Meanwhile, Richard had been bumped about in the car boot and felt sick and very scared. After some miles, he realised that they had reached a town and at last the car stopped and he heard the door slam. Mr. Purton must have got out. Thanks to the bit of wood Julian had wedged in, the boot was not too difficult to open. Richard looked out cautiously. He was in a dimly lit street and a few people were walking along the pavement. He tried to clamber out, but he'd been huddled up for so long he was too stiff to move. Instead of jumping out and taking to his heels, he had to go very slowly indeed. Just as he decided to try and jump from the boot, he heard Mr. Purton's voice. Hey, you, what are you doing in my car? Richard jumped, fell sprawling to the ground and ran as fast as his stiff, cramped legs would let him. He knew he mustn't be caught. Mr. Purton caught up with him and grabbed his collar. Gracious, it's you! The boy Rookie wants! What are you doing here? How did you... Oh! Oh! God, oh, my ankle! Oh! Richard had kicked Mr. Purton's ankle so hard that he nearly fell over. But his legs were now feeling better, 
and he wriggled free and raced down the road. Mr. Purton ran after him. Rounding a corner, Richard collided with another boy, but was off before the boy could even call out. Mr. Purton collided with the same boy, who angrily grabbed him by the coat. By the time he'd shaken himself free, Richard was away again around another corner, panting hard. He could hear his pursuer's footsteps gaining on him. He stumbled round another corner and found himself in a main street. And there, opposite, was a lamp that had a very welcome word shining on the glass. Police. Thankfully, Richard pushed open the door and almost fell inside. A policeman at the desk looked up in astonishment. Now then, what's all this about? Richard was panting so much he couldn't say a word at first. Then it all came out. The policeman listened in amazement and then made him repeat it all very slowly and clearly to a senior inspector. When he'd finished, the policeman spoke kindly to him. You've done very well, young man. Quite a hero. Now, we'll phone your mother and take you home and you can leave the rest to us. Mr. Purton had raced straight back to warn the others as soon as he saw Richard go into the police station. He drove like a madman back to the Dean, tooting his horn as he went up the hill, so that the gate would be open for him. Finally, he pulled up at the front door where Rookie and two other men were waiting. What's up, Purton? Why are you back so quickly? Anything wrong? Wrong? Do you know what's happened? That boy Richard Kent was hidden in the car, in the boot or somewhere. Didn't you miss him? Of course we did. Did you let him get away? I got out to see Ted and I didn't know the kid was there. I nearly got him, but he ended up in a police station, so I gave up the chase and came back here. You fool, Purton. That's our ransom gone and the police will be here any minute. Now, it's no good crying over spilt milk. Now, what about Weston? If the police find him, it'll be back to prison for you, rookie. And you've only just come out. What are we going to do? Think. Come inside. We must think! The four children had heard Purton's car come racing up, and Julian had managed to hide by the kitchen door and hear the conversation. Good, good, good. Richard had got away. He tiptoed to the hall when he heard the men go inside and enter a room. He could hear them talking, but he didn't like what he heard. I'm going to give those kids a bashing as soon as I can. They must have planned Richard's escape. Yeah, but what about the diamonds, rookie? we better put them somewhere safe before the police get here. We'll put them in a secret room with Weston. If he's safe there, then they'll be safe too. You see to that, rookie. We'll spin some yarn to the police that Richard and the kids were trespassing and we kept them here as punishment. All right, but I'm going to put those kids through it after I've hidden the diamonds. Someone's going to pay for all this. And I'll shoot that dog. Don't be foolish, rookie. Do you want to get into trouble again through your violent temper? Leave the kids alone. No! They're going to pay for this! Julian felt very uneasy indeed. Then a brilliant idea came to him. The children must hide, and he knew a perfect place. In the secret room. He went back to the kitchen and heard Rookie go up to see to the diamonds and told the others about his plan. It's a wonderful plan, Ju, but somebody else is hiding in there. You saw him last night. I know. But he's the last to give us away. He won't want to be found himself. It will be an awful squash, but I can't think of a better place. Timmy will have to come too. Of course. We may need him to protect us against the hidden man. He may be pretty angry about us invading his hiding place. But once we're in, he won't call out because we'll tell him that the police are here. Fine. Let's go if the coast is clear. Yes. They're all upstairs destroying papers and things. Julian led the way to the little study and went to the big solid bookcase. He felt for the knob and pulled it. The back panel of the shelf slid noiselessly downwards, leaving a large hole like a window into the secret room. The children gasped. They blinked through the hole at the small room behind, lit by candlelight. A man looked at them in astonishment. Told you to open the panel. Where's Rookie? We're coming in to join you. Don't make a noise. Hey? In you go, George. And you, Timmy. Yeah, now look here. I won't have this. Where's Patton? Patton, where? Another word and I'll set my dog on you. 
You in, Dick? Yes. Anne? Yes, I'm in. I shall have to stay outside and put the books back, otherwise Rookie will notice the shelf is empty and guess we are hiding in his secret room. Then we'll be at his mercy. Oh, Jew, you must come with us. I can't, Anne. I must shut the panel and put the books back. I can't risk you being discovered till the police have caught that madman Rookie. Police? Are the police here? At the gates. He pushed the knob. The panel slid back into place and he replaced the books on the shelf as fast as he could. He was just going out of the study to hide somewhere when he heard footsteps. It was Rookie. He caught sight of Julian. He looked crazy and carried a whip in his hand. Julian darted back into the study and locked the door. Rookie began to hammer with such a crash that Julian guessed he was smashing it with a hall chair. Julian was very scared indeed. Then he caught sight of the wheel handle, ran to it and turned it. And the machinery went into action. Rookie was still crashing at the door, but Julian knew now that the police would soon be there. And so did Rookie. He flung down the chair and fled. A sound echoed through the house. Open in the name of the law! Julian raced to the front door and pulled back the bolts. There were eight policemen there. An inspector stepped forward. Which boy are you? Julian, sir. Where are the men? I don't know. Probably in that room there. Come on, then. May I ask what all this is about? Since when can a man's house be broken into for no reason? We're having a private little conference, and you break in like ah, you... Ah, our friend Rookie, I see. You're only just out of prison, aren't you? And in trouble again. Where's Weston? I don't know. He was in prison last time I saw him. Yes, but somebody helped him escape, and somebody, friends of yours, know where the diamonds he stole are hidden. Where's Weston, Rookie? I'll tell you, I don't know. Search the old house. Purton won't mind, will you, Purton? Look for the sparklers anywhere you like. I don't know nothing about him. Purton, we've suspected that you are responsible for many prison escapes. You arranged change of clothes and a safe hiding place till the man can get out of the country. Utter nonsense. And you only help criminals who've pulled off a big robbery and either stuff before they go to prison, then you make a good profit out of the deal. Where's Weston, Purton? And the diamonds? They're not here. You can search the place. Go on, search. I know where the hidden prisoner is, sir. And the diamonds, too. You don't know anything. You only came yesterday. Oh, yes, I do. Come with me, sir. Julian led them to the study and went to the bookcase and swept a whole shelf of books out. Then he pulled the knob back and, from the space behind, the faces of three children gazed out. And a man. The children were just as amazed to see a crowd of policemen there as the policemen were to see the children. Well, 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 if it isn't Weston himself, large as life and twice as natural. Keep Rookie quiet, will you? Might as well hand over the diamonds, Weston. I've got them here, sir. They're under the bed. When the children were out of the secret room, Julian told the inspector everything. How they had seen the clothes thrown down the well. How the Bentley had arrived at the shack for Weston. And when he gave the number of the car, KMF 102, Purton glared at Julian as if he could have crushed him. Before being taken away from Dean, the children asked the police to be kind to Aggie, but not to Hunchy. And then they were whisked off to spend the night at the home of Mr and Mrs Thurlow Kent, who had put out a fine spread for them. Richard was at the front door waiting for them. I wish I'd been there at the end. I was very angry with Richard when I heard what he'd done. I'm ashamed of him. Richard was foolish and landed us all in trouble. But he more than made up for it. Getting in that boot and escaping like that to warn the police took some doing. I think quite a lot of Richard now. Yes. Well, well you are, Richard. Richard. Oh, thanks. I'll remember this. Well, see, you do, Richard. It might all have ended differently. But it didn't. It ended like this, so we can all breathe again. Till the next time. What do you say, Timmy, old boy? <laughs> <laughs>